This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. While the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen. And personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared in experiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pain. She would always come over to my bed in the night, complaining that she'd heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused, and I told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't, and begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was wrong. I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light, and I looked through her door, that was when I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the foot of her bed. It turned and looked at me. 
There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on, and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked, Did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, Did you see the tall dark thing at the foot of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I can't explain what we saw together that night, so many years ago. She's convinced it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. When I was in my late teens, early twenties, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old-looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay and was keeping me safe. I work as a service manager at a Chipotle that is rather understaffed. As the manager, I'm the last one out, and due to staffing, that's usually pretty late. To make matters worse, I commute by bike, so I like to get changed when I finish all my work. This means I'm usually alone for at least 15 minutes in the basement of a strip mall, well after everyone else is gone. From the entire area, not just the restaurant. Because of this, I've heard strange noises and felt a presence behind me. And others have even mentioned being pushed down the stairs or have reported things being thrown down. We have cameras that look down the staircase and trust me, it's pretty weird to watch what happens. But the worst was that one night I was here alone until 2 a.m. doing a full inventory. The last employee left at 12.45. The building was locked down and there wasn't a single other person in the entire strip. But by 1.15, I heard a man and a woman arguing. The sounds were coming from the solid concrete walls. Around 1.30, I heard breathing coming up toward me, so I slammed the office door shut. That didn't stop the breath from coming up to my neck. I could feel pressure on my shoulders. That subsided at 1.50. At 2.10, I was getting changed in the storage room and took my bike out to set the alarm. The second I set the alarm, I hear the sounds of stomping boots running through the kitchen toward the back door, where I was currently in the process of getting out of there. I have never left a building so fast in all my life. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, 
But where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle for the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other, just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting along with my fire set and some other gear up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting 
and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later, to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly, it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. 
he turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble, and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter, and I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot, so I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left, and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine maybe 30 or 40 feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. 
I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold. Like, really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happen sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle? And I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie. But she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. 
I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off and that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. In fall of 2017, I was picking up a friend from his dorm room in the early morning at sunrise. I was parked in my car on campus at Denver University. As I was waiting for him to arrive to the car, out of my peripheral vision, I saw what looked like a shadow person. It was just a torso though, and it was up floating on the sidewalk about 30 feet away from me on the other side of the road and going in the opposite direction of me. The second I turned my head to really acknowledge what I was looking at, the figure completely disappeared, and below it, a cat appeared out of thin air and sprinted across the road. I have no idea what I saw. This happened last year when my grandmom was admitted to the hospital and I was visiting her. The hospital was an hour's drive from my cousin's place. 
At about 11.30 p.m., my uncle and I left the hospital to go back to my cousin's place. A little context. This was in Jammu and Kashmir, India. The main city, Jammu, is connected with other smaller towns via a main highway, so we had to use that to get anywhere. We were about a 20-minute drive away from home when we see this woman standing along the edge of the highway, hair tied back cleanly and wearing the traditional red sari or wedding dress with blood flowing along her arm. My uncle, with an intention to help, started to slow down until I alarmed him because I saw her bare feet, which were reversed. We sped past her, all the while chanting Hindu chants because we're a very religious family. As we got home, we had a strong fever that was gone by the following morning. We asked around, and we were told that there was this girl who lived near the highway, who had slit her wrists on her wedding day a month ago because she was being forced into marrying this guy she didn't want to marry. Many people see her and crash their vehicles in confusion. I still remember her clear as day. I'm getting chills even writing about it. This is going to be pretty short, but I'm going to get straight to the point. I've been seeing shadow people for the last few months. They are not all the same, though. I don't know if it's normal, but I see them in groups of one to three. I'm interested to know if it's coincidence that I keep seeing them, or if there's some reason for it. I have met a man with no face before, but I'm not sure if that might have anything to do with it. I'm not making this up. I just want some answers. I don't know why I keep seeing these things why they show up in groups, and why they're slightly different every time. What do you think? So I'll preface this by saying that I've had some pretty insane experiences. This is one of the tamer ones, but it's recurring, and it's always the same. I've lived in four different states in my life. Grew up in Indiana, went to college in Kentucky, lived for four months in New Jersey, and I currently live in Missouri. In that time, I have lived in give or take 20 different houses, apartments, and dorms. I've also worked in many different places. This black shadow person has shown up in almost every single one of them. I say it's a shadow, but he's really just kind of a big black mass that definitely looks three-dimensional and kind of fizzles out at the edges. That's the best I can explain it. He usually disappears within four or five seconds of me seeing him and I always check to make sure that it wasn't my own shadow. The first time I remember seeing him was at the house that I was born in, right before we moved. He was standing in the garage, then quickly disappeared. After that, I would see him in my doorway when I was playing video games. I would see him at school down the hallways. One of the more memorable times was when I was at work and I saw a black figure walk up to the register to my right. I thought a coworker had come in to start his shift. I said, hello, and my boss was standing next to me and said, who the hell are you talking to? I replied that my coworker had just walked in and my boss said, um, no, no one else is here. He showed up the night my parents told my brother and I that they were getting a divorce. He was sitting between them on the couch, which I thought was odd. He showed up the day before the worst medical emergency of my life. I was flipping through the mail at my mom's new house, and I could see a black figure peeking around the corner, about 10 feet from me. I looked up, 
and it was gone. I looked back down and it was back again. This happened three times. On the fourth time, I looked up long enough to see the hands wrapped around the corner of the wall and the full head and shoulders before it ducked back behind the corner. The very next day I had a migraine that presented itself as a stroke at the age of 18. He showed up the day I left for college. He was standing beside my car. He showed up in my dorm room right before I walked out into the hallway to see my stalker standing there, smiling at me. She was real, and I'm still not sure how she found my dorm room on the 16th floor or how she got in. We had to be swiped in or swiped out with someone who lives there as their guest, but that's a whole other story. My girlfriend saw him once right after we had moved into our new apartment. He was standing in the doorway to our bedroom while we were watching TV. She hadn't believed me when I told her all the stories of him just appearing out of nowhere at major times in my life. She saw him that time and believes me now. I've seen him five or six times in the last five months. I saw him on the morning my grandmother died and at her funeral. He was standing next to my father. I saw him at my college graduation party, standing in the corner. The closest I've ever seen him was when I got my new job and was sitting at my desk for the first time. I looked up from setting up my new work laptop and he was sitting in one of the chairs immediately in front of my desk. This is the first time he didn't immediately disappear. I could see him for about 30 seconds and I felt this feeling of approval radiating to me. It was like he wanted me to know he was proud. My girlfriend believes that it's the ghost of the miscarriage my mom had the year before I was born. The black shadow has always been close to my size, if not slightly bigger. She thinks that he's trying to be my big brother and warn me of bad things that might happen, or to be there to support me during major life accomplishments. I tend to believe that because it sounds better than anything else. The reason I'm telling this story is that I had an incident recently with what I thought was my shadow friend. I was on a fire scene, drawing up a diagram in this old rundown building that was being renovated into apartments in a small town in southeastern Missouri, literally about 40 feet from the Mississippi. I'm standing in this room that's being remodeled when I see him in front of me, in another room. There's no drywall on any of the walls yet, so I can see the entire area. I stop and look at him and nod my head. When he disappears, a bucket comes flying off a workbench in front of me and lands a good seven to eight feet from where it was sitting, about two feet in front of me. I'm scared out of my mind at this point, and I go back into the area of the building that had already been finished and was where the fire had occurred. I'm waiting for the lead investigator to get back to the scene when I hear footsteps coming up the stairs behind me, followed by the very distinctive sound of boot steps on wet insulation. I called out to the investigator with no response. The boot steps continued very slowly until they reached the doorway, but nobody was there. I get chills just thinking about this. What concerns me is that I saw my shadow friend immediately before all of this, but he's never made a sound or moved anything before. I've also never felt fear around him, only comfort or confusion. I also haven't seen him since. I have no idea what the hell happened. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water, 
and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area, outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel where the signal is out black and dark gray instead of black and white, and it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until... I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse. Eventually, the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. 
The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night. But I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room, and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general, but who knows. I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. So, I was born and raised near central Pennsylvania. I was a boy scout from the fifth grade until my 18th birthday. This story takes place in the summer of 2007. My dad was the scout master, and my brother was the camp master for years at the camp where this story took place. Needless to say, scouting is in my blood, and I've always been engrossed in it. During weekend campouts, we would always play jailbreak, cops and robbers, some people call it. One team, the cops, tried to catch the other team, the robbers, to bring them to a central point, the jail. Anyone on the robbers team that wasn't yet caught could run to the jail, touch it, and yell, jailbreak, and release anyone inside. This went on until all the robbers were caught, and then the team switched. We would play from around 7 to 8 p.m. until about 2 to 3 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. Now, for a week in summer, our scout troop would go to a Boy Scout camp in Pennsylvania for a week to get merit badges, to gain ranks, and to gain skills in scouting. Usually, summer camp happened in late June to mid-July. I would also go to a church camp for a week in early June before scout camp. It was when I was getting picked up from church camp, knowing that scout camp was only a week or two out, that my dad took me aside. He told me that one of the kids, Brian, not his real name, was hit and killed by a driver that was texting and driving. The area we live in is rural. I guess Brian was just walking off the shoulder between his parents and grandparents when he was hit. It was a 35 mile per hour zone in a straight road area and the lady that hit him was going almost 55. To my knowledge, she was never charged with anything from the incident. We went to the viewing later that week, 
and then summer camp the week after. During that week at summer camp, we were at one of the campsites located centrally. Each site was named after a Native American tribe. We were the only scout troop in the campsite, so we decided to play jailbreak. There were eight of us playing that night. At the campsite, there are bathrooms called kiabos that have two stalls and a urinal with a sink, all covered by a roof. This campsite in particular had a steep bank just on the far side of the kiabo that you could lay down against and not really be seen in the dark from someone looking down the hill. So our whole team was laying against it, ready to run in all directions once found. We had someone watching behind us, uphill and to our right, as I watched to our left. I noticed somebody watching us from behind a tree. The tree was maybe 30 feet away from where we were laying. The person looked like they were wearing a gray hoodie with the hood pulled up. They were peeking from behind the tree and then ducking back behind it. I said, hey, guys, is that someone looking at us? Everyone looked, then a flashlight from one of the adults swept across the bank and the tree as they walked around the campfire above us on the hill. As the light crossed the tree, I distinctly saw the tree shadow and no person's shadow connected to it. And yet the person was still peeking out and didn't seem to light up as the light crossed them. As we saw this, somebody yelled, run, run, get the hell up. We ran to the campfire, and the other players were looking for us already. They were getting ready to search for us. Turns out, our friend was killed wearing a gray sweatshirt and was one of the best catchers in the game. I like to think he was having one final game with us before he crossed over to wherever we go. About five years ago, I was in the Air Cadets, a UK organization affiliated with the RAF. My squadron was and is based in the Sergeant's Mess at IWM Duxford, a former RAF station, now a vast air museum. On this particular occasion, it was a summer evening and dusk was settling in. I was in charge of a camouflage exercise which involved the cadets using camouflage to hide and me trying to spot them. I was walking past several World War II era buildings when I saw two figures in the distance walking toward me. As I got closer, I saw that the two figures were US Air Force officers, not an uncommon sight, were not far from RAF Lakenheath, a US Air Force base, maybe they're visiting. As I got closer, I realized that they were wearing very outdated uniforms and had flying equipment that was extremely old. Still not thinking much of it, I saluted them as I walked past, as is customary. They didn't acknowledge the salute, nor did they say anything. I walked off, feeling a little uneasy. Later that night, as the exercise wrapped up, I remembered the incident and I asked my commanding officer who the two officers were. I got a very odd look. He said, Corporal, we haven't had any visitors tonight. Concerned that somebody may have broken in, security made a site-wide search, but could find nothing. They then quizzed me, and when I described the airmen I had seen, a grim look came over their faces. They proceeded to let me know that this wasn't the first time they'd been seen. Back in 1944, a B-17 flying fortress visited the airfield and took some personnel on a joyride. The aircraft collided with a navigation mast at low altitude and smashed into an accommodation building, exploding on impact and killing all aboard, plus one man in the barracks block. The building was located right next to where I had been walking. Furthermore, the men I described they were the pilot and the navigator. They have been seen a few times over the years, often by security making patrols at night. 
I've always felt like I'm being watched when passing that spot. And sometimes I wonder if others feel the same way. This is the story about the night that made me believe. When we were about 20, my friends and I were really big into doing scary trips to haunted roads and things of that nature. This one is about Clinton Road, deemed the most haunted road in America. It's so scary they even made a movie about it. This story takes place before the movie was even a thought. So there was a group of friends. There were three of us that were the closest and then two more that would tag along here or there. The three main guys, myself and two others, were all huge football players, with the smallest of us standing at about six foot four and 230. So we were never really scared to do any of these things, as we'd looked like a pretty intimidating group of guys. I had to work late on a Friday night, so they decided to go visit this road without me. Most of it sounded like the typical hype and adrenaline scare. But one thing stuck out. They told me when they were there, they received texts from an unknown number stating, why are you on Clinton Road? And the texts even described what my friends were doing and wearing. They showed me the texts, but I figured they were faking it, trying to make it sound scary, knowing that I would be super mad that I missed out. They also explained to me a legend that a child died in the water under the bridge on the road and that if you throw change, the ghost boy would return the change to you, known to us as Ghost Boy Bridge. On top of that, there's a ridiculous bend in the road there called Dead Man's Curve that even if you're doing a modest 30 miles per hour, you could easily crash and tumble off the cliff. It's said that a ghost truck will chase you throughout the road and try to get you to crash. I called total BS. I then convinced them to take me there the next day, being as I was off of work. It did not disappoint. We get there and immediately I see the road is in the middle of the woods, covered with ritual signs all over the road. I knew that this was not a typical road. We came up to the bridge and parked. As soon as we got out of the car, I checked everyone's pockets so that they wouldn't be trying to pull anything slick, to try to drop change on the road when I wasn't looking or something like that. There were a total of five quarters, one for each of us. We all tossed them in the water over the bridge. About five whole minutes go by in total silence. I decided to break that silence by saying, told you, BS. We then turned to walk back to the car. We get about 10 feet away and cling, 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 the sound of change hitting the ground. We go back to the bridge and there are five quarters laying directly in between the two yellow lines in the middle of the road. Thinking it was one of the other four people there messing with me, I came prepared. So I signed one of the quarters with my initials and we threw them back in the water. About five more minutes go by, and again I say, See? B.S. It was one of you guys messing with us. We then proceed to walk back to the car, get about ten feet away again, and... Cling, cling, cling. The sound of change hitting the ground again. We turn back around and go see what it was, and sure enough there were five quarters laying in the road, with one of them having my initials in my handwriting. We all were going nuts and decided to run back to the car. After getting back to the car, we decide to keep going to see what else the road had to offer. But keep in mind, we were spooked from the change thing we just experienced. About 10 minutes go by and a few of us had to pee really badly after holding it for the entire car ride. So we pulled up to this random castle looking building, no bigger than a small house, but you could tell it was extremely old. We decided to just stop there 
because there was this little indent in the road where a car could pull over. We all get out to go. I go to my immediate left and do my business. After I'm done, I notice one of my friends is walking towards the castle thing, almost in a trance-like state. We yelled his name to come back, but he kept walking. We all ran up and grabbed him and shook him out of it. After questioning why the heck he'd be walking up there all alone, he said, I was following you. You waved at me to come here without saying anything. The problem with that was the fact that the entire group, including me, had actually been behind him the whole time. We had all sorts of signals as a group, so I would never just wave to him without saying something. I am 100% convinced that he saw a mimic leading him into trouble. The fear level is definitely higher now, so we decide to leave. Like I stated earlier, it's an extremely dark road in the woods, so you can't see much. You have to pass Dead Man's Curve twice, once one way on the way in, and then once, of course, on the way out. We're probably four miles away from the curve when we see headlights behind us. We didn't think much of it, as we thought it was probably just some other kids our age out here doing what we were doing. About a minute goes by after us talking about random stuff trying to ease the mood, and we noticed that the headlights were directly behind us. The headlights looked super old, and you could tell it was a truck because of how high up the lights were off the ground. The thing was, we couldn't see the truck, just the lights because it was so dark there. Getting more creeped out, we told the driver to speed up and try to get this crazy truck off our tail, but he was sticking right on us, going around bends at high speeds, straight straightaways, everything. We couldn't shake him. The problem with this is that we were in a brand new and modified sports and performance car. If someone were to be driving an old truck, or any truck for that matter, there's absolutely no way that they would have been able to keep up with us for more than 30 seconds. But this thing was on us for what seemed to be miles. Finally, about a half mile away from Dead Man's Curve, it's almost as if the lights shut off and we lost it. So I remember pulling up right after the curve and pulled over so we could find our way back to the main roads. Meanwhile, there's just woods on both sides of us. We're all talking very lightly, just in case something crazy were about to happen, we could hear it and be aware. Two minutes go by. After getting service to our phones, one of the guys got directions, so we were in the clear. Right before the driver put the car in drive, we hear this deafening screech, which sounded like a woman's scream. It literally sounded about 20 feet from us so loud that I actually lost my hearing for a couple of minutes. When we looked over to where the noise had come from, ugh, I will never, ever forget what we saw. I know this is going to sound crazy, and if it didn't happen to me, I would never believe it. We saw a typical movie scene, white dress, black hair figure standing there. But next to that was a clown hanging upside down from a tree, swinging back and forth, smiling at us, moving its head in any direction we moved. The clown was like an old school type of clown from back in the day, like sideshow creeper clown with a big circular neckline. I can't remember much detail about it, except for that damn circular neckline and the chilling old school vibe. Now this totally could have been a prank, but to have set that up as a prank, you would have to have both immense patience for someone to come to that exact spot or balls of steel to be doing that in the woods in the middle of nowhere with just two people. There's just no way. I don't think I've ever been in a car that moved as fast as ours did after that little sighting. We then found the main road and headed back. Going home, we did research, and that's when we found out about the legends of the ghost truck and Dead Man's Curve. It was such a rush. By the time we got home, it was probably 2.30 in the morning, and we had already forgotten the feeling of how scared we actually were. 
So we all decided when we got home, let's do it again tomorrow, which would have been a Sunday, to see who really had balls. We all parked at my friend's house so he could drive us, so we all had to drive ourselves home. I live 15 minutes away. On the way home, I noticed that a rundown church in my town had letters put up on their board. They never use it, so it was really strange to see it. The board stated, you're going to need Jesus on Sunday. About a minute after passing that church, my radio cut out and started playing Bloody Sunday. It's safe to say I made a call to the group telling them we were not going back. It's been about seven years and I refuse to ever go there again. But that night, that night made me believe. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, 
thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book, and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's, and one day she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy like she did my wife. I was stationed at the Ivory Coast in 2002. I got to know the locals fairly well. My parents were Muslim converts, but I was more agnostic than anything else. I used to pay people to cook for me. $20 there will fill up someone's pantry. I spoke Arabic and the locals I got to know also spoke it. One day, a local called Kashif asked me if I wanted to pay a visit to a neighbor who was possessed they were going to pray over him. I said, sure, why not? It wasn't anything like Hollywood. It was kind of peaceful. The possessed guy was chill. There was no deep growling voice or anything like that. He looked at me and asked what the thing was, pointing to my shirt. I've had a charm my mother gave me since I was a teen. 
It's a tiny leather triangle with something inside of it that's supposed to ward off evil, usually worn around the neck or right arm. This was pinned inside my shirt, behind my front pocket. There's no way anybody would know. I played dumb and said my pocket was empty. And he said, no, underneath. So I unbuttoned my shirt and made sure my fingers covered it and said, what? He said, under your fingers. I got a chill. I said, how did you know? He said the name of a guy who had passed away years ago. He was the guy that wrote the charm back in Australia. I noped out of there. Back at the base, I stood in front of the mirror trying to see if there was any kind of giveaway. Nothing. I spoke to Kashif later and he said, Jin can sense these things. At that point, it was like I was asleep my whole life. There are other forces out there. I read more into their belief of the djinn, and frankly, I was terrified. A family member bought this little box with a mirror inside, like a jewelry box, at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, but then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer, thought it was a great price, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out. She brought it into the home, into a room near the kitchen, and left it there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table and then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied person coming up on her. She heard something make a sound in her left ear she said that she can't remember the exact sound, but when she originally told me, it was almost like a negative, ah. It wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, somewhere in the middle. It made her jump and made her let out a loud shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave and that they were not welcome there. She said it out loud several times and in the garage and inside and outside the house. She placed a Bible on the object and held a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought somebody was trying to play a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her. But there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom, quite a distance away and another person was on a totally separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking and yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what had just happened. This all happened very quickly, around 5.40 p.m. local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, brought home, and then very strange things started happening. For example, an antique wooden clock that was purchased in another state would hang on the wall and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if somebody had moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room, but nobody messed with the clock and nobody turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name, as if somebody was calling for you, but no one actually was. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this home. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it wasn't welcome. The other experiences did not feel negative, maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on, 
It's still very infrequent, though. Off and on. While writing the story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote. Things like that. And while trying to save images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with this and is just a software issue, but who knows. Update. The object has been donated to the Goodwill. She sent texts to four different people after donating it and included an image of the place that it was donated. The images disappeared or showed up blank or with a note saying that they weren't able to view it. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to what's going on here. Any insight, feedback, or comments would be greatly appreciated. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city. So most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night, around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything, and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down, and asked the people to help us. Somehow, we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall and I slept facing the wall. The whole night I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days, to the point that I play a TV show in the background and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then, something happened. One night, I'm struggling to sleep, when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. This became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up and went to sleep. The next morning I wake up for class and he's getting ready too. And he brings it up again. He says, your new friends are weird. 
They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him and it did not look like he was joking. At this point, he was sober too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayatul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayatul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say in my native tongue, Something that means, do whatever you can, I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on, and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room, in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream, until the man, sitting there, turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long, black, snake-like looking things, like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart, all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow, and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin, who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room, and after asking around a bit, we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls, and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. No more sleep paralysis or whispers or visits or scratches or waking up in new places or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it. And to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long.
Years ago, I was living outside of Buffalo, New York, on an old estate on the Lake Erie shore. I rented the carriage house of an old mansion that a doctor and his wife owned. The doctor was a heart surgeon, and they were a well-to-do couple with multiple properties, so they weren't around that often. I liked the solitude of the place, having just gotten divorced, and although the carriage house was slightly decrepit, I loved living there. The mansion overlooked the lake, and my house was closer to the road, off of a private drive that went from one side of the estate to the other. The carriage house had been a servant's quarters for whoever lived in the mansion at the turn of the 20th century. There was an enclosed courtyard outside my door that was bordered by the back of my house, the carriage barn, which had stored carriages back in the horse and buggy days, a row of empty horse stalls, and a brick wall with an entrance to the courtyard. It was a very cool place to live. The rent was cheap, and there was a private 150-foot-long beach that was hardly ever used by anybody but me. But it was very isolated if there was nobody staying in the mansion, and there weren't any close neighbors because all of the houses along the road were big estates, and a lot of the rich people living in the area weren't full-time residents. But I was young and brave, and it was a big estate full of decaying spookiness, and I'm a weirdo that likes that kind of stuff. So I was overjoyed to find the place. One night, I was coming home late, around 1 a.m., from a friend's house. Driving down a street a mile or two from my house, I saw a dark figure up ahead, standing close to the road. I thought that was kind of odd, because it was late at night on a weekday, not exactly party time in the Buffalo South Towns. I started to get a little nervous, because the person was standing as if they were waiting for someone to pick them up. As I got closer, I could see they were wearing an unusual black shroud-like thing, long and dark and draped, with part of it wrapped over the person's head to look like a hood. It was similar to someone wearing an abaya or a hijab, only much looser, like a bunch of material just wrapped around somebody's body. It seemed totally inappropriate for what I knew of the people that lived around the area. Nobody ever wore anything like that and certainly not outside at one o'clock in the morning on a weekday. The person was just standing by the side of the road, looking stooped over and old. I slowed down to a crawl as I approached, worried that the person needed help. Maybe it was an older senile person that had walked out of their house in the middle of the night, confused. When I got close enough to really see the person, she lifted her head and looked my way and I saw that it was my ex-mother-in-law. I was absolutely, positively sure that it was her. The same gray-brown hair, the same eyes, the same enigmatic smile that had always made me wonder what she was thinking about but never saying. She raised her hand and waved at me. Not a stop and help me wave, but more of a gosh, it's good to see you wave. That scared the hell out of me because my mother-in-law had died three years previous to when I was driving down that road. I sped up and kept driving, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But a few minutes later, and a few deep breaths later, I told myself I should go back and take another look. My mother-in-law had loved me. I couldn't imagine her ghost would appear seeking revenge on me for divorcing her son, who had not treated me well, to say the least. I drove in a square by making left turns and went down the same road again, but there was no one there. I was too freaked out to go back to my spooky carriage house with the weird sounds and hundred-year-old history, with nobody there but me and the ghosts I was convinced probably inhabited the place. So I drove to the local all-night Greek diner and sat there for an hour, drinking coffee and calming my nerves. When I finally drove home and into the courtyard, I could see that something was wrong. My door was standing open. The glass windows were broken. The door was cracked almost all the way through from one side to the other. Someone had destroyed the door to get into that house. The next day, I found a crowbar in the courtyard, 
thrown off to the side. The only things I noticed missing from the house were just a few pieces of my clothing, super creepy, a jar of loose change, and a knife from the kitchen. I was just divorced and not exactly rich. I didn't have much worth stealing. It's very scary when someone breaks into the house you live in, all by yourself in an isolated spot. They must have driven right into the courtyard and would have been hidden from view while they broke down the door. I called the cops. They never caught anyone. With all the upset of the break-in, it wasn't until hours later that I remembered having seen my dead mother-in-law waving at me from the side of the road, dressed like the Grim Reaper. I'm convinced that she somehow appeared to delay me from going home, that if I had driven straight to the carriage house, whoever the person or persons were who had broken my solid wood hundred-year-old door practically in half with a crowbar might have been waiting there for me, or I could have surprised them, and that things might have turned out very differently for me. This is a pretty tame story compared to some other things I've heard, but I think about these experiences all the time, so I thought I'd share them. My husband and I own our home. It's fairly new, built in 2006, and only one couple has lived in it before us. As far as I know, nothing bad has ever happened here. The first experience was when I was home alone with my children. My youngest was asleep, and my oldest was coloring at the table in the kitchen. It was the middle of the day, so the windows are open and no lights are turned on. I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, crouched down to put a pot under the bottom cabinet, when I hear the click of the light switch and the kitchen lights turn on. I turn around fully expecting my husband to be home. He isn't. Creepy, but no big deal. Months later, both of my kids are in the nursery while I'm taking laundry out of the dryer. Even though I can see into the nursery, I can't see my kids because they're playing near the bed, which is against the wall. I hear my son jumping on the bed, and I keep telling him, don't jump on the bed, be careful of your sister. I do this a few times until I get a little frustrated, and I say, don't jump, in the classic parent tone. Directly in my ear, I hear a man's voice in a loud whisper say, don't jump. I immediately dropped the clothes and ran into the room, but of course, no one was there except my kids. A week after that, I walk next to our closet to see all of my husband's hangers swaying back and forth. I never feel threatened or nervous in my home, except for when these instances happen. I tell my husband about them, and he says he sees weird things all the time, but never tells me because he doesn't want to upset me. So yeah, I kind of hate it. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear, that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. 
She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below. And on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock. And while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible, and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks and suddenly the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding, it was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs 
Someone opened and then closed the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave. And then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs. And finally, all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick tock, tick tock. Eventually, sleep caught up with me and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you too, and we miss you. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place, a place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one bedroom bungalow. At first we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe, and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor, under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off. Until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes, my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days, and I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything, until one of those nights. I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up, and at first, I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. 
The next night, it happened again, louder than before. Only this time, I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was five o'clock a.m. on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home, and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, Ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there, or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, Is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow, I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces, and one was an old lady. She was frowning, and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over-enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger, like she was coming closer to the glass, and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. 
Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield made me think about that old lady's mouth, but it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs and my room was across the hall at kind of an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms farther down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost I called her Pam. My mom told me that I began talking about Pam around the age of five and that I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my wild imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. She knew that I could see her and I knew that she could see me, but she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pam came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs, waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would just be sitting on a bed or standing in one of the rooms or the hallway harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. When I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I just said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me. And I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back so I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing anything. So she didn't come up in conversations as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. 
I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing up my stuff, but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to be moved into, I was asleep in my room. My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream of Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard her talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifelessly by a rope. Her boot fell off of her foot and hit the floor and I woke up. Holy crap. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream, right? Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day, life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see into it while laying down on the bed. But this time I heard a weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day, the woman that had been hanging from the light fixture was not only alive, but was holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I could not contain my emotion. I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed as a 17 year old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something, but I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the door frame of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, oh my gosh, mom, she's in here. I held my breath and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again and I ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day and I slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely and before the next buyers moved in, the entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause was listed as spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. That was my bedroom. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago on Zillow and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpeting but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house, but there's almost no information at all. Just basic architecture and lot line documents. It's the craziest story, but this was my childhood. Part of me feels sorry for Pam, but another part of me knows that there's something strong and dark in that house. I know Pam loved me in a way, but there's no way I would ever go back. I am Puerto Rican and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, 
I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley, that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. 
I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside. But I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. I lived in an apartment in Hawaii where I had a lot of terrible nightmares. The layout of the apartment went like this. You stepped through the door into the foyer and immediately to your right was the kitchen. To your left was a shoe closet. There was a half counter separating the living room and dining room and to the left of the living room past the shoe closet was a T-shaped hall. The shorter hall was at the front and it led to two bedrooms, one at each end and the long hall that split this short hall went past a full-length mirror, washer and dryer, two sinks, and ended in the bathroom. This hallway consistently creeped me out. Noises, movements out of the corner of my eye, and a mounting sense of dread every time I stood in the hallway was already starting to manifest, along with a lot of other instances. In order to avoid being scared from my nightmares, I slowly start to become a night owl. This means sleeping all day and staying up all night. Well, one night I decide to shower for whatever reason at a time between midnight and one in the morning when everyone else in the household is asleep. I start doing my usual routine, starting with washing my hair, when I start to hear a faint noise that wasn't water hitting porcelain. It takes a moment to register what I was hearing. A woman screaming, absolute bloody murder. Anger and horror and anguish are obvious in her voice, but it was so faint I couldn't possibly fathom where it was coming from at first. I turned to look out the tiny window in the corner of the shower, the only form of ventilation in our bathroom, and I think that it can't possibly be coming from there. After all, I live on the 22nd floor. So I'm rinsing the shampoo out of my hair, dwelling on this screaming which is still going on, when I finally pinpoint it. It's coming from the drain, between my feet. Okay, I think. It's probably a neighbor, watching TV, and the noise is just traveling through the pipes. No biggie. I'm fairly convinced of this now, and I'm on that train of thought, wondering who in the world is watching TV while in their bathroom and wasn't doing that a dangerous thing. As I'm thinking along those lines, as if to retaliate my nonchalant brushing off, the screaming starts to get incrementally louder. Of course, I figure somebody's just slowly turning up their TV. 
It takes seconds to register that the screaming is turning to faint screaming and gargling. It's not a TV. It's literally in the pipes, and it's coming closer, starting to echo as it comes up the drain. Then this thought hits me. What will be here if and when it finally reaches the end of the drain? Fear suddenly washes over me, the sort of fear that led to me shutting the shower off, soap still half in my hair, falling out of the shower in a panic scramble, and backing away as the screaming continues. I don't bother with clothes or a towel. I leave all the lights on for my parents to scold me about in the morning. I didn't care. I ran through the hallway and into my room and locked the door. After that, I never showered again unless somebody was awake. From then on, that little window in the corner of the shower, I could feel someone staring in through it, constantly watching me. Every now and then, if I glanced up at it out of the corner of my eye, I could see the swish of long black hair disappearing out of sight. I hated that apartment, and in some ways, I still do. This is a story that happened in Hawaii to my brother and his friend. We moved from Japan when I was barely a year old. We spent some time in California, of which I can barely remember, then Louisiana, my dad's home state. But then by the time I was four, we had moved to Hawaii, on the island of Oahu to be specific. At first we lived on base housing, but my dad soon retired from active duty and thus we were upended and forced to find new jobs and a house. We ended up in one of those single-story duplexes that shared a common wall. We lived in the back apartment, where we had our own patio and a huge garden in the back that our landlord's wife took care of. The landlord lived in the front portion with a garage and a patio. I never knew this little tidbit of information until after I moved out, but apparently, her mother used to live in the section we lived in and had died there a very old and very happy woman. It was her garden, and she had loved it and taken care of it like a child. Thus, we were always told to treat the garden with respect, which my brother and I did without question. In this house, it was mostly very quiet. There were little things here and there that I can remember. Footsteps in the grass in the evenings, our dog barking for hours on end at something nobody could see in the backyard. A shadow of a little girl standing in the doorway to my brother and I's room, simply peeking in curiously. The only malicious and strange thing was the room that my brother and I shared, which was constantly, and I mean constantly, cold. It felt like there was an air conditioner on full blast in that room, but our house did not have an AC unit at all. Also, if my mom and I spent too much time in that room, we would get headaches that wouldn't leave until we left the house. But just because the house was odd didn't mean that it didn't spook the hell out of other people. Cue my brother's friend, Jay. As I knew Jay, he was a very open, friendly, fast-talking dude who loved to just be happy. I liked him a lot. Where my brother was smart-ass or introverted, Jay was outgoing and always willing to actually talk to me. A lot of the kids on my block were around my brother's age instead of mine, so I always tried to hang around him and his gang, which wasn't cool with him at all. Because A, I was the baby and couldn't keep up with the big boys, and B, it's not cool to let your sister tag along. It was always a boy's thing. But Jay never let any of those factors bother him and was always happy to hang out with me when the other guys wouldn't, so I knew him as a brother. Obviously, my brother had a lot of friends and we constantly had people over. This made my mom happy, because she had always dreamed of having a lot of kids, so she sort of mothered and adopted each and every one of our friends. Our house sort of became the house everybody wanted to stay over at, so there was always somebody sleeping over, well into our high school years. 
This story takes place while my brother and his friends were about 16 to 17. My brother had his first serious girlfriend and was constantly hanging out with her. When apart, calling her on the phone. Jay was staying the night. My brother was in the kitchen, which is mostly fenced in by walls and a half counter, talking to his girlfriend on the phone, while Jay was merely zoning out to music on the living room floor. All of a sudden, it gets cold. Not the whole room, either, but just a certain spot, to his side over an arm. Weirded out, he glances that way to see nothing. Then this spot starts moving, up his arm, over his neck, up to his mouth, and he describes it as the strangest sensation, like kissing a pair of frozen lips that aren't there. It's then he realizes something's not right, sits up, touches his lips, and looks around for whatever just kissed him. He finds nothing out of place, aside for a cold spot now a bit farther from him, close to where our couch was. He calls for my brother to come and check it out, as confirmation he's not imagining this cold thing. My brother comes around, still on the phone, and when he hovers his hand in that particular area, he seems pretty surprised to find it's remarkably cold. Now, here's where it gets really weird. At this point, Jay says my brother's face blanked out. His eyes glazed over, and he went limp so suddenly that he dropped the phone. John distinctly remembers hearing his girlfriend saying, Hello? Hello? Is anyone there? What's happening over there? Of course, my brother fell back onto the couch, and his lips were moving, but nothing really came out. Jay tries to snap my brother out of it, so he gets close and starts to shake him. That's when he can finally hear what my brother is saying. In a feminine voice that was definitely not my brother's, he was repeating, I'm sorry I did that. You just reminded me of someone I loved, over and over. When he gives him a particularly hard shake, my brother snaps out of it and seems relatively confused as to why he's on the couch and the phone is on the floor, why Jay looks so freaked out, and why the cold spot was no longer there. Anyway, my brother shrugged off the whole thing, laughed at Jay, called him a jokester, and quickly went back to talking with his girlfriend, with apologies and sweet nothings. Jay was shaken. He never spent the night at our house again after that. He said he felt like he was constantly being followed and watched in our house, and he always tried to make a point of not staying too long. This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was 21 years old, just finished basic training for the Air Force, and I didn't have my tech school for another six months, so the Air Force sent me home. While home in Hawaii, my parents decided to take me to Vietnam to visit, as I'm Vietnamese and my mom felt it was important for me to visit the motherland. On the trip, it was my parents, my four-year-old brother, and my best friend Dan. For most of the trip, we did what normal tourists did. One of our destinations was the city of Kanto. It's a harbor city. Not thinking anything and never really believing in the supernatural, I was also excited to visit historical sites and stay at old hotels. We ended up staying at a hotel that was by a harbor. I don't remember the name of the hotel, but Dan and I shared a hotel room and my parents and little brother had the next room. I remember going to bed like it was any other ordinary day. I was dreaming, and I saw this figure laying on the bottom edge of my bed. This person was laid in the fetal position. For some reason, my eyes were focused on his feet, then started to slowly move up his body, and then I realized he was naked. Then I saw his face, and at that moment I made eye contact with him, and he stared back at me. Once that happened, I began to have sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I could hear myself screaming, but nothing was coming out. I kept screaming, 
Dan, Dan. But he could not hear me. So I told myself to calm down and try to burst out. And that's what I did. It worked. I jumped up and woke Dan up. The first thing my friend asked me was why I was so pale. It looked like I'd seen a ghost, he said. I told him what happened. It freaked him out and we ran to my mom's room and woke them up. My parents asked me what happened. As I was explaining to them what I had experienced, the curtains covering their window began to sway back and forth and the lights in the room started flickering like crazy. My dad, who's a total skeptic, yelled, leave my family alone. And it just stopped. After several minutes of talking and trying to understand what happened, we went to bed. Dan and I slept in their room on the extra bed. The next day we woke up and my parents were already downstairs eating breakfast. When I went downstairs, my mom greeted me and told me she had someone for me to talk to. It was the hotel manager. She had told him what had happened and he told me, yeah, it happens a lot to people who are in the military. I was confused and asked why. He said this hotel had been built on top of what used to be an American hospital during the Vietnam War. And he said that they were trying to reach out to their comrades. I became a believer in the supernatural then, and have been ever since. Last October, my best friend, Tanner, died unexpectedly. I don't need to go into too many details because they're not relevant to the story, but it was easily one of the hardest hitting losses I've ever experienced. He and I shared a very close and special bond and had overcome a lot of life together. He had moved in with our mutual friend, Beth, and her boyfriend several months prior to passing away so I would constantly come over to hang out with everyone as I lived nearby. One summer day, we all had a giant Nerf gun fight together in their front yard. I distinctly remember making eye contact with Tanner and having this strange gut feeling at the time that this was going to be a bittersweet moment. But I brushed it off as just being sad that summer was coming to a close. I felt uneasy that he had at the same time a sad, longing look in his eyes that I did. It began to get dark out. After collecting as many darts as we could, we headed inside, and Tanner declared, this isn't over yet. A month later, after noticing many strange behaviors, Beth and her boyfriend made the heavy decision to call Tanner's mom and have her convince him to go back to rehab. Three months later, Tanner was dead. I have moved out of state since, but I always go back to visit Beth when I'm home. One day, after a heavy snowfall, I pulled into Beth's driveway. Just as I hopped out of my car, Beth came to the door to greet me. Something yellow popped out against the fresh snowfall, immediately catching both of our attention. We looked down and directly on her front step, perfectly placed in the untouched snow, with no footsteps around, was a nerf dart. Well played, buddy. Well played. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12 and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. 
It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry and I left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle. It lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed side after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello and what's up? We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night though, I was having trouble falling asleep and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep. And for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again, and I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice, and when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. 
She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day. And I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. So my dad used to work at this restaurant that was extremely haunted. The building was very old, built sometime in the mid 1800s, and there were records of at least a few deaths happening on the premises back when it used to be a boarding house. Staff used to complain about cold spots, weird smells, and sometimes something would push by them when there was no one around. But there are two first-hand accounts from my family directly. The first story is my mom's. Well, technically I was there too, but I don't remember it because I was only two years old at the time. It was my dad's turn to open up the restaurant that day, and she had gone with my father to spend some extra time with him while he did prep work. She went to the bathroom and took me with her. As she was washing her hands, she heard three knocks on the bathroom door, evenly spaced. She thought that my dad was playing a joke on her. So she whispered to me, her father has no rhythm, and knocked back in a fun pattern, a rap tap tap kind of a thing. She expected my dad to crack a joke or knock back in a playful way. But instead, the reply was three evenly spaced knocks. After she left the washroom, she saw my dad coming down from the second floor of the restaurant. Very funny, honey, she said. My dad was very confused. He had no idea what she was talking about. To this day, he says that he did not knock on the bathroom door. The restaurant was locked. You don't want customers wandering in before you're open, after all. My parents and I were the only people there. That's the first story. The second is mine. But before I tell it, I'd like to go on a brief tangent and describe the restaurant a little bit better to give you a better feel for the overall vibe. In general, the interior was always pretty dark. The only windows in the place were at the front of the building facing the street. And that natural light didn't do much because the building was very long. The back of the restaurant near the kitchens was the darkest place in the whole building, but it always felt the coziest to me. No, the worst area was, paradoxically, the brightest. 
There was a patio attached to the second floor with an adjoining sunroom, the worst room in the whole building. The rest of the restaurant was very cramped, very dim, very Dickensian. Good old Victorian architectural design. The sunroom, in contrast, was very open, very light, and it had a lovely view of the patio and the pretty flower boxes we had out there. And I hated it. Standing in that big empty room, you could just feel all of the space behind you. And you always had this unsettling thought that something was watching you. I used to hug the walls a little whenever I was in there because that way nothing could stand behind me. I mention this because my story happens on the second floor. There was going to be a fundraising event on the second floor and I got recruited to help out. My mom had me running around, putting up decorations, cleaning the works. Normally, I was scared to be on the second floor at all, but it wasn't so bad because I was with other people and I had a job to distract myself with. It was actually the first time that I had ever been up there and had fun. That didn't last long though. The first strange thing that happened was a painting went flying off the wall. And I do mean flying. It didn't just fall. It went a good few feet horizontally. Of course, this was spooky, but we all just rationalized it, put the painting back on the wall and kept working because people were going to start arriving in a few hours. Once the event got started, that was when the real trouble began. One of our friends, Sally, went into the second floor bathroom. When she tried to leave, the door wouldn't open, even though it wasn't locked. At this point, she got a bit nervous and knocked on the door, hoping that someone on the other side could help her get it open. And that set something off because suddenly the entire bathroom erupted into loud banging. It was a commotion. People outside heard, including me, and we all gathered around the bathroom door to try and get her out of there. We had her lock and then unlock the door. We jiggled the doorknob. We even tried forcing it open. Nothing worked. Inside, what was muffled banging to us sounded deafeningly loud to Sally. It really freaked her out. We were only able to get the door open once the mysterious noise had stopped. Weirdly, we had never had any issue with that door sticking before, and I don't think we had one after. Sally put on a brave face, but it was clear that she was pretty rattled. In private, she later confided that it was one of the most frightening things that had ever happened to her. Later on, after all the guests had left, I was helping clean up. We had a small stand of necklaces for sale set up on the minibar. A pendant in the middle started swaying forwards and backwards, like someone had flicked it with their finger. The rest of the necklaces were perfectly still. My mom saw this too. We both looked at each other and quietly decided that it would be best to not make a fuss and to get out of there as quickly as possible. I think that night set a record for the most unexplained events that had happened in the entire restaurant at once. It closed down a few years later, was mostly torn down, and was rebuilt. I don't know if the new building is still haunted or not.